Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to AIGA Design for Good webcast. Um, this is a series started with uh, support from the NEA and additional funding from IBM. Um, we're starting our second episode. We started last December with Social Impact 101. Um, this is a webcast today dedicated to uh, equity and gender equity. Um, my name is Leticia Wolf. Uh, I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at AIGA. And I'd like to give you just a quick overview of, um, of what AIGA Design for Good is about. But first of all, let me introduce to my right, my special guest, Linda Decker. Hi, I'm Linda Decker, co-chair of AIGA Women Lead. And today I'm going to be joined by uh, Deborah Adler, uh, co-chair emeritus of Women Lead and AIGA Chapter Development Associate Director, Corey Straussman. So to give you some background quickly about this Design for Good um, effort of AIGA started uh, in 2011, um, it is really an umbrella. It's an ethos that AIGA has to really tackle all kinds of social issues, complex social issues that are uh, manifested through a number of initiatives that uh, AIGA leads, such as Women Lead, uh, but also diversity and inclusion, uh, design for Democracy, and the newly relaunched Design for Communities, which really looks at all kinds of social impact in, in the cities and, and with nonprofits collaborations. So this is an incredible opportunity for this webcast to also give you an overview of all the different activities that are happening at AIGA and give you sort of inspiration, tools, and practices around, around um, Design for Good. So with that, no further ado, um, this webcast is uh, the beginning of a launch of a particular program of the Women Lead Initiative called Gender Equity Toolkit. And I'll pass it to you, Linda, to explain a bit more about this. Okay. So today, um, we are very excited about launching this toolkit. Some of you may have seen the launch at the AIGA conference in Las Vegas earlier, um, in, well, back in October. But today, Deb and Corey are going to demonstrate um, AIGA's Gender Equity Toolkit, which is a collaboration between AIGA Women Lead and sociologist Leila Ajaralu of Disrupt Design. And we are so excited about this launch because we know it can have a lasting impact in the workplace. This kit is firmly grounded in research. Um, and gender equity is really such a complex issue in, in the workplace. But there are some very real statistics, and some of them you might already know, which is that women make up 60% or so of the undergraduate um, graphic design population, but yet are only 11% of the creative directors. Statistically, women make 20% less than men um, in the workplace, but the latest data from the AIGA Google Design Census reveals actually something much more alarming, that in the most senior positions, the disparity between men and women, a salary and compensation is, in some cases, up to 60%. Mm -hmm. Is that shocking? Yes, I know. Some of these visual visualization of this data were like trying to hint at this, and we'll, we'll continue our own report at AIGA. Right. Take a look at Ann Willoughby's graphic. Mm -hmm. um, so we obviously need to change this. Uh, but going back to the toolkit, Layla's academic research was amplified with interviews and workshops with over 100 um, AIGA members, both in um, workshops and in these specific interviews all around the country. And women, are the, what she found was that women face so many different barriers, and most of this results from unconscious bias. And unconscious bias, it really constitutes that legendary glass ceiling all the way down to just simply failing to take credit for contributions to group work. And because as a society, our, our vision of leadership is still very male-oriented, and male traits are really consider, considered much more desirable in these leadership roles. But unconscious bias is really the root of what happens and what is inequitable in the workplace. So this toolkit has been created to make us aware of these biases, and the exercises help us to make connections build empathy, and practice high-stress scenarios so that we can give people the tools so that they can succeed. So, And, and to add to this, a note about the, the, the game. You know, it's a game. It's a card set. And it demonstrates that also learning through playing has been, yeah, it's, it's, it's the best way that you can actually learn something. You experience it in a fun way. 
uh, you know, the neurologists at Harvard University in cognitive science have shown like the learning through playing is like one of the top way of learning anything. So hopefully you'll have fun while questioning yourself. And empathy changes our neurological pathways. Exactly, from like this part of the brain to this part of the brain, I think. After the video that we will play for you, these videos are actually on the website. You can have fun and look at them. Um, there are um, three sets of videos. We'll play two of them. And then when we come back, you will experience um, live the game with Deb and Corey. And the last part of the, the webcast will be dedicated to a Q&A with a special guest from IBM that I'll introduce then. So see you soon. Hey, I am Leila Ajaralu, and over the last year, I've been collaborating with the AIGA to figure out how we can get more women into positions of leadership within the design industry. The Gender Equity in Design Toolkit will help do that. But first, I want to share with you some of the pieces of key research that I uncovered during the project. Deep inside our brains, each one of us hosts a range of gender biases that influence the way we perceive others. No one is immune to these. And studies have found that making people aware of their biases doesn't erase them at all. In fact, it often makes them more pervasive. So the Gender Equity Toolkit, it's designed to help foster equity in the workplace by busting through gender biases and building new norms through empathy. Like it or not, we all have gendered expectations that subconsciously influence the way we see other people especially when it comes to leadership. So research has found that the dominant frame of what it means to be a leader is imbued with all of these very male traits, such as aggressiveness, assertiveness, and authority. And because of this, women have to chameleon themselves into this pre-existing mold. Yet once they get to the position of leadership, they are expected to fulfill the more womanly stereotype of being sensitive, caring, and empathetic. So we just can't win. I mean, all of this creates what is called a double bind, where we're expected to basically be two different opposing personas in the same role. This is just one of the many invisible obstacles that inhibit our ability as women to equitably access leadership roles. So to overcome this, what we need to do is not only redesign these brain biases that we have, but it create entirely new frames and models around what it means to be a leader. In the past, gender-related issues were really obvious, uh, but nowadays they're a lot more covert, often occurring in very subtle ways, such as microaggressions, some of which you might not even notice. In fact, many women I spoke to during the research relayed stories of this, but they themselves were confused about what actually was impeding their ability to progress. There's a big difference between explicit and implicit biases. Explicit acts of bias are really obvious. They're the sexist, inappropriate judgments that people make very overtly. Whereas implicit biases are the subtle actions that appear in many insidious ways. These are the main types of biases that we have to deal with today. And so our task is to challenge them, to rewrite the code that created the biases to begin with. So all of this is topped off with this strange phenomena that has emerged in our workplaces, where women take responsibility for what's called the silent office housework from cleaning up after meetings to organizing social events. These types of communal activities fit in with the outdated gendered stereotype of womanly activity. And what's more, research has discovered that this type of extra work reduces women's opportunity to progress. As basically they commit valuable work time to activities that fall well outside their job description. So we may have busted through the glass ceiling but let's not ignore the new pervasive sticky floor syndrome, where women get stuck in middle management. And there's also the glass cliff phenomena, where women are put into positions of leadership in turbulent times, resulting in their likelihood of failure being much greater. 
because it seemed that they'll be soft and they'll be kind when the company's already going through shaky times. So they literally are put there to soften the blow. Despite all of these obstacles, there are many opportunities that we can all embrace. And it's not just leaning in. We need all different types of leaders, from the quiet to the loud. And through this research, I did discover one really cool way of overcoming some of these systemic issues. And that is that organically formed mentorship are the kinds of things that help women overcome some of these systemic issues within the workplace, but also it gets paid forward. Nearly everyone I spoke to who had received this kind of natural, organic support early on in their career would just naturally go ahead and pay it forward when they got into a position of leadership. Ultimately, we want to get to a position of equality within the industry. We want men and women to be equally represented based on their merit and capabilities, but we need to get there quickly. And so one of the critical intervention points I discovered was this idea of equity. Equity is the equal access to resources that people need in order to flourish. And so we need to design workplaces that encourage equitable access. And one of the key ways of doing that is by fostering deep empathy, which is why the Gender Equity Toolkit is for both men and women. It's designed for the boardroom to the classroom to help bust some of these biases and re-script the codes that created them. So get out there, bust cognitive biases, start the important conversations, experiment with reframing leadership roles, and let's work together to make the design industry one of the most gender equitable out there. The Gender Equity Toolkit contains four quick exercises designed for use in both professional and educational settings. These exercises will help foster empathy and encourage equity by reprogramming the implicit biases that we all have deep inside our minds. I designed each of these activities to address a specific cognitive bias and to create the new neurological pathways of empathy, appreciation and leadership. These activities can be played in small groups over a coffee or in a boardroom, even to hundreds of people at a conference. All you need to do is to follow the simple, easy to read instructions and get playing. So, here's how to play each one. Empathy is a visceral experience of understanding the feelings and emotional state of another human. It's a very powerful tool in overcoming the stereotypes that feed implicit biases. So in this fast-paced exercise, you have a pair of people who quickly get to build an understanding of another human's perspective of the world, getting like a map of the inside of their mind. Everyone in the room is handed out five of these word cards from the moderator. And then you're randomly put in pairs or just find another human. One person starts by holding up a word and reading it out loud to the other. The partner must quickly say, if they feel that the word is more male, female, or neutral, based on the visual image that the word triggers in their head. Once they say what it is for them, they then explain what they see, and the first person who read the word explains how it is for them. In this sharing, you get a very quick understanding of the inside workings of someone else's mind, and then you can swap to a new word. Swap turns back and forth until the words run out. If you're having fun with it, encourage people to swap, find new people to talk to, and new words to play. We humans are narrative-driven creatures. We connect through shared values and experiences. As Joan Didion said, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And our brains like to hold schemas and structured references of other people. And while useful in remembering and forming opinions of those we meet, this can lead to misconceptions and accidental prejudice. In this next activity, have everyone take a random connection card and then walk around the room casually collecting five stories that connect them to another person. Use the question card as a starting point. People will find they have all sorts of weird connections and points of reference. This game helps build new perspectives of the people around us and find opportunities to understand what people need to flourish professionally. 
It's also a great icebreaker to get people in the mood for some of the other activities and to open up conversation. A great way to build the mental muscle of tackling a complex career hurdle, such as asking for a raise or negotiating a salary deal, is practice. And in this role-playing exercise, we divide into groups of two and have everyone decide who's going to be the boss. The other person is given a scenario card with a goal printed on it. The person's task is to get the boss to grant them whatever is printed on the card, such as negotiating for extra paid sick leave. The trick here is that the boss's job is to say no five times. It is a lot harder than you think. Each player gets to build the experience muscle and develop empathy for the other person's position. So make sure you play a few rounds in a different role to get the full benefit. Sometimes the best way to get over a challenge professionally is to get some good advice. So this activity is all about fostering peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. It's a simple activity where people break into pairs and get to interview somebody about their current experiences. One person interviews the other for five minutes, writing down the key insights that they get in the quadrants. Then you swap, giving the opportunity for each person to openly share some of the issues that they're facing. After you've spent 10 minutes doing this, take a couple minutes to think through what your partner said and think about some of the actions, tactics, opportunities and potential challenges and strengths that you could recommend them. Then you share those ideas. And this gives you the opportunity to get a different perspective to a career problem that you might be facing. The Gender Equity Toolkit is a simple and fun way to get the conversation started around gender and leadership. I hope you enjoy these exercises as much as I enjoyed designing them. So jump onto the website, leave us feedback on social using the hashtag gender equity and use the tool, start the conversation. Let's see how quickly we can get the design and technology sector to have full gender equality. Hello, I'm Deborah Adler, president of Adler Design and co-chair emerita of the Women Lead initiative here at the AIGA. And I'm Corey Straussman. I am the chapter development associate director and we are going to demonstrate how we use this gender equity toolkit and how we get to play it together. Um, sometimes you can play it in a group. Some of the activities call for that, but you can also always do it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the first one, as Layla described in the video, is connections. And you can always find um, an intro card for each section um, as, part of the, as part of the set, and it gives you the information on how to play in case you forget. Um, so I am going to get my card, and I'm going to ask... Corey, a question. And the question is, what is the one thing that al always improves your day? He's going to think about it and answer, and then we'll talk about it. It's a good question. I would have to say coming home to my fiance, Shauna. Oh, that's so nice. And why is that? Uh, it just always brightens up my day. It's just it's a nice reminder that I'm not at work anymore and that I'm home, and it's just you know, fun to be around. That's great. I think one thing that always improves my day is taking a bath at the end of the night. <laughs> um, okay, so that's how you play that game. Do you want to ask me a question? Sure. So here's your question. And your question says, what is the one thing you're most proud of professionally? Ah, uh, well, I think I'm, um, I love what I get to do professionally because I um, get to work um, in an environment where I re really get to pay attention to people who are at the heart of my a part of major healthcare issues, and I get to um, help them. I think probably the thing that I'm most proud of is designing a system for prescription medicine that makes it easier for people to take and manage their medication. You know, this is an icebreaker game, and it's great to be able to use it just to start to get to know other people more and understand them more, and it, it really starts to increase empathy, and you get to have a deeper understanding of the people you're playing with. Um, the next game is empathy building, and each person gets six cards. Uh, we're just going to do a few for example. And then you have to, um, when you hold the card up, you need to have a mental image in your mind of whether it is a female feeling, a male feeling, or a gender neutral feeling. There's no right answer. You just have to um, say whatever comes to the top of your mind. So you want to go first? Sure. 
shirt. So I thought of a male um, because it just ima I imagined men in suits and wearing undershirts underneath those suits for some reason. <laughs> what did you think? I, I thought the exact same thing. Interesting. I wonder what that means for women. <laughs> <laughs> Car. Men, uh, male, again, you know, just, just thinking about uh, it's always been kind of a male-driven, no pun intended, type uh, type enterprise. It's, you know, when you think of uh, car chase movies and everything, you think of like Steve McQueen and Paul Newman and, and stuff like that. So it just kind of strikes me as, as a male. Okay. For some reason, I thought female, and the f image that came to my mind was Christy Brinkley in a convertible somehow <laughs> with her hair going. I'm not sure why I thought of that, but um, I thought female for some reason. Maybe I was going the opposite. Next. Oh, this is a strange one. Pineapple. Mm, female. I think of welcoming, home, um, comfort, hospitality. Honestly, it was neutral to me. Nothing really registered for me. Mm, I wonder why. Cold. I'm going to say female. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking more of the sickness than the actual feeling. <laughs> and I don't know why. But I'm just... Maybe because I have a cold right now. <laughs> As does my fiance. So I guess that's the first thing that's coming to my head. That, same with me. It's the exact, I thought of myself and um, I had a female version of that. Finally. Puncture. Okay, puncture, I think male. Um, I think of a wound and getting punctured. I think male as well. I just think of like almost like a sort of like a wound or like a stabbing or something like that. And that a male presence would be the person who would be doing that. So that's the gist of this game, and it can go um, on and on. Um, let's move to scenario testing. So scenario testing also is, has its own card, and this is really about how to negotiate for what it is that you, um, what it is that you want in the workplace. So um, I am going to ask a question to Corey, and then he has to, um, you have to answer, you have to try and negotiate for what you want. And first we have to decide who's the boss. You, I'll be the boss. Sure. Okay. And then you can, you have to try and figure out what it is that you want, and then we can switch roles. Okay, so here is the first question. Sure. You are asking why your more junior coworker was promoted over you. Okay. Okay. Put on my face for this. And you have to have an ask at the end. Yes. So. Hi, Deborah. Hello. So uh, I noticed that uh, that. James recently was promoted, and I know that he had more of a junior title. Uh, I've been here two years longer. I mean, I understand that he's done some great things, but I was wondering um, why James was promoted over me. Um, he has a different skill set from you. It, it's kind of um, a different reasoning for why he got promoted over you. It doesn't have to involve you at all. I understand that, but I feel like I've you know worked really hard this year and that I've put in my dues. And James, I mean, he honestly, he just got here and, you know, does it really make sense that you should be rewarding people that, you know, are, are relatively, you know, recent hires as opposed to someone like me who's, you know, worn a lot of hats and done a lot of work over the last year? I feel like that I've demonstrated my value and I just want to be rewarded for that. I think that you do excellent work. I agree. And um, the reasons why James was promoted um, have nothing to do with your skill set. He has um, executed. Um, he has executed things in ways different that have to do with your job. Different ways that have to do with your job. I appreciate that, but uh, you know, I was just wondering. Um, you know, now that I've you know sort of made this ask, do you see some sort of time frame of allowing me to be able to move up the ladder? Is there anything more that I should be doing to better improve my chances? It just make me understand better what I could be doing or what I haven't done to be able to earn that opportunity? Um, keep on doing what you're doing and um, we will consider it, you know, further on down the road. I think that you're doing excellent work. Um, we really value your work here. 
Um, and we will definitely keep that in mind as we move forward. So there's nothing more I can do or say at this point? I understand. I appreciate it. But just wanted to know if there's any wiggle room or anything. No, not at this point. Okay. Okay. Wow, that's tough. Okay, so now um, why don't we switch roles? I'm a little sure. nervous for this one. It's a hard <laughs> one. Um, okay, so my question is, you are trying to arrange to work from home. Hi there. Hi. It's great to see you again. Good to see you. Um, I just wanted to connect on a few things. I've really been enjoying working here, and I feel like I've been doing excellent work over the past um, several years, and especially over these past few months, I've been doing um, some really interesting initiatives within the company. And surprisingly, I've been doing, um, being, being working, working from home, I've been um, even more successful than at work. And I was wondering if you would consider um, continuing that um, sort of schedule so that I could perhaps work from home one or two days a week. Well, I certainly appreciate you coming to me and asking me that. But, you know, uh, I think that there needs to be a certain synergy in the office. And I just like to have all the employees here to be able to create and collaborate. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to grant that request at this time. I understand that you want synergy. Um, as you've seen, we've had a lot of success with communicating over webcasts and um, Google Chat and other ways. And in fact, a lot of our clients are located all over the country, if not the world. Um, and I'm able to have conversations with them much more so than I do with a lot of the people even in the, in the company, since my relationships with um, the clients are very important. Um, I also have uh, um, certain things that I need to be at home for later in the evening, and it would be very useful for me if I didn't have to make that long commute. I think my time would be more effective, less time in the car, more time working if I were home. I understand that, but, um, you know, I don't want to set a precedent where I start granting you the ability to work from home, and then, you know, everyone else in the department or in different fields comes in and asks to be granted as well, and then it turns out that I'm the only person in the office, and I have to sort of herd cats to be able to get everyone in the room for a meeting when I could just call everyone from their desk. Okay, well, how about if we do it um, one day a week and we just sort of settle it there because then I could really, because um, especially on Fridays, the traffic is brutal and then I could really try and focus my time on work and we could check in, you know, all day long. I can have all my meetings with my designers and my team and it would really be as if I was there. Uh, In fact, I might even put more demands on my team. I would have to seriously consider it, but I'm, I'm leaning against it. Great. So should we try it maybe next um, Monday or next Friday and we can see how it works out? We'll do a test okay. for a one-day test. Let's try it. Great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that was tough. Was it? <laughs> that was tough. I wanted to say yes so much earlier. Oh, my God. Okay. Great really job. That was Great fun. job, okay. you guys. Thank you so much. Um, this is Rose Newton, who's jo joining us on the screen. She is the uh, senior design manager at IBM. She's going to join uh, this conversation today, and she's also going to join the Women Lead Committee, which is really exciting. Um, exciting. We're starting with new members that we will be announcing uh, in a couple weeks. So um, Rose is joining us. I hope you can see her on the screen now. Yeah, we're good. And um, Linda is going to, thank you. We're like teenagers here, like listening to Rose from a, a waist. We're not listening to music, promise. Um, Linda is going to ask uh, Rose a number of questions. We already have a bunch of questions from the audience, which is really exciting. Um, so I'll be moderating the conversations and adding to whatever Linda is asking and directing the conversation. We'll bring back Deb um, in about 10, 10 minutes. So go for it, Linda. Okay, great. So um, Rose, we are so excited to have uh, you on the committee and to have IBM support for Women Lead. So just to kick it off, we'd love for you to tell us a little bit about IBM and your company's gender equity efforts. Well, first off, let me thank you guys for um, allowing me to participate. Um, uh, yeah, so IBM has been around for over 100 years, and they're located worldwide. 
and they have over 400,000 employees. So this is a unique scenario when it comes to equity and diversity. And um, I think they have several programs that help uh, establish um, uh, initiatives to help different situations in different countries. So for instance, um, a lot of the teams are in other countries and so um, based off of certain countries there's global initiatives. So there may be a, an initiative um, in China or in India or in the United States that are based off the cultural um, differences within the different um, areas. Um, IBM has a, a group called the Business Resource Group and in that they look at the different cultures, um, different sexes, um, genders, and just all of those in, and have different groups that help support those systems. Um, so globally it's an interesting challenge because of the different biases, not only male, female, but culturally that come with that. Um, in the United States, uh, we also have kind of regional things, and so um, you know, there's the Network for Emerging Women Leaders here at IBM. It's a place where people are partnered up and, ment and are mentored to help go towards the executive path. Um, and also on the technical side, there's the Pathways to Technical Leadership for those of the um, people at IBM who are on the more development side, more of the technical side, but paths to move up in the career chain as well. Um, IBM has a lot of uh, opportunities for help and just groups to meet and discuss these things. Um, specifically, IBM Design, which is the group I'm in, has their own women uh, mentorship programs. Um, I, I'm involved in the IBM Design Women Mentorship Program where um, senior female designers are partnered with executive females and, and um, mentors outside of the design area so that we can understand how to move and where to go with our careers as we move forward within IBM. And internally in the design area we have uh, mentorships um, within the studio um, um, and a lot of unofficial mentorships that happen and I see a lot of that and personally I do a lot of kind of unofficial side chats and talks with folks. Um, what's nice about IBM design in particular they have a clear path of your career growth set, up, set out in fact they're just now releasing a uh, design career playbook so that you know the different levels and what things you need to do in order to move forward um, overall considering how large this company is and how diverse and spread out I believe that they're doing a really good job in kind of capturing the needs for all the diversity of the cultures and of the genders across IBM Wow, Rose, that's, that sounds fantastic. Um, could you just maybe give us a story from your perspective, something personal that you experienced that really helped you? Um, sure. Well, you know, I feel like uh, a lot of this mentoring and moving forward and finding your career path has to do with your early influences. And for me, um, when I first started off my career 20 years ago, I was a designer at Enron. Um, and my mentor at that time was an older, um, she was my boss, she was an older female, um, mid-level executive who kind of um, guided me through the path and how to navigate the executive waters. Um, she allowed me to sit in on meetings that I probably shouldn't have been sitting in, just kind of in the back to be able to observe. And there were times that in executive meetings as a 20-something year old young designer they would ask me my opinions on business strategy and you know that opportunity that she gave me gave me the confidence to know that I can sit in a boardroom no matter my age or my status of you know my my uh, my job position but to state what I feel is you know the right thing for the business or the design decisions and so uh, I look back 20 years ago to that one the Sharon who did that for me and as a designer now, um, as a senior designer, female designer here in the studio, I look to do the same for others. And I do that mostly, you know, just side conversations, coffee, and all of those things. But without her giving me the leg up when I first started, um, I don't think I would have had the confidence to be where I am today. Have you found yourself um, in, in a situation where um, you were, you've been mentored by men? This was actually a question from the audience. You know what? That's actually a, an interesting question. Um, so IBM, traditionally, it's a tech industry. There's a lot of men. The men outnumber the women. Um, 
so yeah, actually I've had men mentors. And what's interesting is that uh, I don't think they were mentoring more at me on the long the sides of, you know, you're a female, so let me help you, but more of you're a colleague, let me help you get better in the business. And uh, yeah, there have been times that I've looked up to other men to kind of help me and navigate the, the waters. And um, But yeah, I think it depends on where you are and in the situation. But here at IBM, it's just that there's a lot of, the, the proportions are, are kind of skewed when it comes to male to female. Um, Rose, we're wondering, you, you've heard a lot here about unconscious bias in the workplace and about the gender equity toolkit. Do you feel that the toolkit could enhance a workshop at, um, in a corporation since that has been a great deal of your background? Or do you think it could amplify some of the current efforts that happen in the corporate workplace? Well, absolutely. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with IBM design and the design thinking um, methodology, but one of the primary focuses of the design thinking practice is empathy. Empathy for your users when you're creating whether it's a product or some solution. And so using the uh, toolkit almost kind of turns it on us where we're not only we're discussing empathy for our users, but we're discussing empathy amongst each other. And um, I really am excited that this is coming out. I'd love to give it a try. Um, we do workshops here all the time, but looking at empathy for others, not for ourselves. And I think it would be a nice kind of twist and, and kind of a icebreaker to get um, dialogue started, especially here um, in our workshops. Our workshops consist of people from around the world who fly in. And so there's cultural bias, there's gender bias, and there's a lot of um, things that we want to level set. And so an activity like this could help kind of break the ice when all these people come together for workshops. I mean, to this point, there was another question about the, the sort of challenge of applying such a tool to very different cultures. Um, you haven't applied the toolkit yet. We hope you will. But can you give us an example of uh, a situation in which you had to uh, figure out how to adapt whatever you were teaching or presenting to the various cultures that uh, represent IBM's uh, staff? Yeah. So um, in my projects, uh, I have developers from around the world, um, India, China, Japan, Germany. Um, I had the opportunity, the opportunity to go to the India office and, um, you know, kind of see how everybody interacts culturally with the male and female roles. And it was kind of a, a unique thing to see. Um, there's some similarities, um, but I also saw some things where, um, you know, some people would maybe not step up where if we were having this in the United States, maybe it would be a different story. Um, so in those situations, when I saw that, I would encourage the females in the group to speak their voice, even though maybe not culturally, it might not be as, um, I don't know, supported so much so. So um, there have been some instances, and I think that working at IBM has given me insight on how different cultures work when it comes to gender um, equity. So, Rose, can you tell us, does um, IBM have any targets set for gender equity or equality or pay, pay equality? I know this is an issue that uh, many corporations are addressing right now. Well, uh, with, uh, our CEO, with our CEO, Ginny Romady, I know that she has um, put into place strong initiative to, to, um, for gender equality. Um, as for like goals and time frame, I'm not exactly sure on that, but it, definitely there are things in place that any of the 400,000 IBM employees can find their niche and their support system for mentorship, whether what country they are, what race they are, or what, you know, what their specific areas. And so, I mean, I really feel like IBM does give, provide opportunity and, um, and, and it's surprising because of how, how large it is how they're able to have these programs across the world. Thank you. So why don't we bring Deb back into the, uh, in the conversation here, and I'll direct some of the questions that are coming from my audience. Um, please uh, feel free to send more questions. We're, we're here for another uh, 15 minutes. Thank you, Deb. That was a great game. Great. So um, you work in a small studio that you created. Um, yes. How many employees do you have? I have um, three full-time designers and a studio manager, so four. And they're all women, I understand. They're all women, yes. Um, they're all women, um, not 
on purpose. It just happens to be that way. Um, and I'm very proud to be a part of a team with them. They are all incredible designers and um, we really support each other. And it help, It actually helps a lot in the office because we're able to work very well together. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that would be the case. It just happens to be a good dynamic. Do you imagine like bringing the gender equity toolkit to your office? Yes, we actually played it. Um, we played it the other day and we enjoyed it a lot and we realized, you know, the way we were thinking was somewhat aligned. Um, and I think that the gender, the toolkit really just increases awareness. Um, it makes you think about your bias in a way that you haven't really brought to the surface. And by actually elevating those um, sort of subconscious feelings, you can then tackle them and face them head on. Um, and that's the reason why I like this um, kit so much is because it really brings things you know, to the level that mm -hmm. I can look at them and deal with them and educate myself um, in this area. And it also serves as an incredible platform to, to grow into other um, areas that deal with equity, inequity, and um, making sure that we're being inclusive and diverse. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a hint or a story about one of the, the highlights of this game at your office the other day? Um, let's see, a highlight, oh, sorry. A highlight of the game would be the question negotiating for the raise. <laughs> that seemed to go over. I think that I think my designers enjoyed that more than I did. Um, but that was um, a real highlight. And, you know, it also was an interesting dynamic between um, being a leader um, and then also being uh, leaders being um, empathetic to situations and also um, the people on the other end being empathetic to um, the boss in that case. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a good conversation. Cool. So I have a really interesting conversation from the audience here that I'd like to direct to, to both of you, really. Um, how do I introduce this topic to my team where you are the only creative and your job is seen as women's work? And Rose, of course, you're, you're laughing already. <laughs> Why don't you take, yeah, why don't you take you're, the first you're pass? The only <laughs> you're the only creative person on the team. Is that the question? Yeah, so how do I introduce this topic to my team where you are the only creative and your job is seen as women's work? You know, that's a tough one. I, I feel like when you're kind of, kind of the lone person out and you need to introduce and talk about this, I think the only way to really do that is more not as in a confrontational setting but more of a casual setting of hey let's let's have this if we're having a meeting let's have this discussion and let's give it a try more as play and you guys talked about play um, and treated that way I think that would help kind of be the icebreaker for it but I think if you kind of came in and said wow we really need this because we're we're having problems then that's absolute yeah that won't really work but um, so, so yeah I, I would so just to loop dive into the conversation yeah. <laughs> basically Rose is saying like de-dramatize the setting in which you bring up this conversation make it like an icebreaker casual thing um, a, a water cooler as we said in our announcement mm -hmm. like Bring it up as a as a game. Yeah, the game right. itself is sort yeah. of very natural it's very and relaxed, non-confrontational. Yeah. What about you, Linda? You also lead a studio in New York with only women. No, no. no we have um, so there are six of us full time and two men, and the rest are women. But I can tell you, the the men and the women do not see. Um, I mean, in terms of the empathy building cards. The definitions of male and female associations are yeah. completely different. Um, I'm not as brave as Deb to do the scenario testing in my office. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of a tough one. As yeah, it, it is you know, tough. That's, yeah. Um, I have another one. My male boss wants to help foster my development. Do you have any advice for moving into a leadership position if you are a female in a company of all male leaders, this one is for it's for Rose again. Yeah. Um, okay. Wow. The engineers' world. So, yeah. So my advice would actually be to reach out to a female leader outside of your business. Um, I I would look to and model yourself after someone that mm. not that you don't necessarily yeah. have to be in your company, but the that you know that you could reach out to, have coffee with, and kind of talk about 
where you want to go, how, where you want to be. Um, it may not be so easy to do it within your company, so I would suggest looking outside. That's a good idea. Looking outside of your company, you, you just need to network a lot. You need to join AIGA, in other words. Um, do you have any tips for um, how a male boss can be a good or a better mentor for his female team members? Oh, can I take that one? Yeah. Because I, I actually, I, I've been mentored by um, a number of different men throughout my career, and I think it's been really valuable because... I think that um, as uh, we, we, we're all susceptible to different gender biases, and I think being able to get the perspective of, of a man in, you know, in terms of situations has been just invaluable mm -hmm. for me because oftentimes I, my reaction to a situation might be more emotional, and often men are just like, that's just business, you know, mm -hmm. and they've really sort of helped me to learn to to look at things without um, as much emotion. Now, Deborah, you you were um, yeah. you have a very famous <laughs> mentor, yes. and I think maybe you yeah. could speak to this as well. No, I mean I was just going to say that I would say all of my most uh, the majority of my mentors in life have been males. You know, growing up in the design community, um, and I it was incredible fruitful relationships. I was able to work with Milton Glaser for six years, and um, I learned so much from him. Um, it's, it's, it was amazing, and I've had a lot of other male mentors, um, but I do miss having um, a female mentor, and I've, I wanted that in my career, and I'm looking for that, and I still look for that, and I feel like um, I would love to be able to give back to other women as well because I, I would appreciate that perspective because men don't go through the same things um, necessarily that, that women do. Um, and when I'm trying to discover ways to move forward, um, it's nice to have someone I can count on. Surprisingly, a lot of my female mentors that I did end up having were my clients, right? Mm. So a lot of the um, clients are women leaders within larger companies and um, I've learned a lot from them. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Yeah. If I can pitch in here, I've, I've worked with men only practically my entire life. I don't think that they were mentors though. Mm -hmm. um, but I love the idea of having um, more of a male-female relationship in, 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 in like growing. For some reason I think of it more than with the women. Yeah. I'd be more comfortable it's, with the it men. It gives you a different perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how does the difference in power dynamics affect the, effect the effectiveness of this exercise? In other words, if you decide to bring your team around the table to play this game and you have the boss and the VP and the top manager and the lower and the ladder guy or girl, how, how do we, I mean, this is like more scenario, scenario building here, right? right. Well, I think if we if we had Layla here, I think she would probably say that everyone has to leave their, mm -hmm. you know, power yeah, dynamics take it at the door. Pers personally, yeah. it's more about building empathy and understanding for other people's. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's a. It, it, I would I would say that you try not to take it personally and um, to try to just get a deeper understanding of um, people and have empathy and try to understand what different roles are and how you can. Um, that's the best way, I think, to break through the bias and get more to equitable positions. Yes, and this is the, the sort of uh, nuance of this empathy game. Is like empathy requires that you are very personal and you give in, in a way. You, you are sincere, yeah. right? You're authentic. Well, and you yet, put yourself in the other person's shoes. Exactly, yeah. but at the same time, you're playing a role. It's almost like this sort of strange, like, going yeah. back and forth between, like, being very, very I you. Think your feelings are real. But I, I, um, I think it's uh, well. I think it will confuse matters if you start to put yourself and get um, offended by situations that are happening while the game is going on. Um, but it's it's a good question of, to in ask. Terms of the dynamics of the um, your of your job, you might get offended by what other people think and mm -hmm. feel in terms of um, equity. But in terms of um, working with your boss in this game, it's just a great way to actually get closer to them and connect to them in ways that perhaps you hadn't before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, like sort of breaking the, the boundaries yeah. that way. Well, and, and almost, I think, is, you know, if you're talking about the scenario testing, it's almost like having the employee play the role of the boss and yeah. then the boss to play the and, role of... And we of, did that. Yeah, 
And because then when somebody is on the side of the employer, part of the rules of the game is that they have to say no five times and they have to give reasons why. So then they start to put themselves in the position of the boss as to what the boss might be thinking. Mm -hmm. And then the person who is the employer who's asking for, say, the raise is, coming, is really sort of almost teaching the um, employee how to... Uh, how to ask yeah, I would I would love to see this on type of a game unfold at you know a big company like you know at IBM with your team. It would be fascinating to see how um, how that works and how role reversal happens and how you can connect with people through that experience. You see, Rose, you have a lot of pressure ahead of you. Yeah, it sounds. I'm really I'm really excited to give it a try. Um, there was one thing I wanted to talk about on that um, scenario that of the card playing game. Um, uh -huh. the, the idea of uh, you know asking for raises and things. Many times I I will practice with somebody who's asked you know like they're going to do that and we practice and we do it as a mentorship thing of like why don't you practice and ask me and I'll pretend that I'm your boss. And so I've done it with few people who are asking for major things and that's helped them a lot. And, I, and I'm glad to see that in this this toolkit. But it's some it's a tool that I actually have personally used on my own so it, you just answered the question that somebody had I just sent for you in fact which is uh, what would you recommend for a woman who has less confidence in the presence of executives how might we develop confidence so you are saying basically you're you're using scenario testing and and trying things out before it, the real thing happens yeah it's all about planning and preparing so that you can go and face the situation yeah, absolutely. Right. When 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 you have like a, a major thing to pitch or bring up in front of people, I always you know would practice or, or run it by people to <laughs> to feel confident in what I'm saying. So I mean, it's taken. Don't don't get me wrong. It's just, I haven't naturally been able to stand in front of an executive group from day one. It took 20 years of this, and so it's something that you're going to evolve and grow into. And so you know you're just going to have to try little bits at a time, um, but little opportunities and small groups and then eventually you'll get into a larger group, larger setting. But um, it's not going to happen overnight, but practice, feeling confident in what you're delivering and what you're saying, and it'll all add up towards the, at the end. So, and, and ask to be present in meetings where you're not necessarily invited. I think we've heard a lot of this mm -hmm. um, at AIGA as well. Um, we have another five minutes um, to, to take some of the questions. They are rolling like crazy today, so that's really exciting. Um, let's see, in a role-playing activity, some of the answers seemed stereotypical. Is there any guidance for how to answer stereotypical responses? Or is it meant to be simply how your partner feels? I know, I think like, that's a very good point, and that's like the purpose of the role-playing game, is that you want to plan and practice and get all of the generic stereotypical stuff out of your system so mm -hmm. that you can really craft a good approach and look at all the different ways that are <laughs> going to come to you and then you can you know keep going and going so you're anticipating what might come at you from your boss and then you can respond in that way. I think what's what's difficult like in this situation with you and Corey I mean yeah. you're you're it's a it's a hypothetical because you're not really his boss and He's not, and he is not really your employee, and you're not actually dealing with the real situation of what is going on. But I think that that's yeah. still, I think that's still very, um, a very. You could imagine that that was exactly. real, but I mean, this was the first time we were doing it. I think you need to start to really practice and get into it, and keep doing it. Do it three or four times until you really feel comfortable. Um, and of course, questions will come at you that you never thought of, but at least you'll have gone down that road, and you can get a lot of the stuff out of your system before even going in there. So you're not going in cold. And then the, the last thing I wanted to, to mention is that this kit exists um, at AIGA in the Women Lead um, uh, Initiative, but you, know, you could look at it from a diversity and inclusion point of view. Um, a lot of these notions of equity, and just to remind everybody to conclude that equity is giving everyone what they need to be successful. It's the equal access and distribution of resources one needs in order to flourish. It's a beautiful definition, which is in the back of one of the cards. Yeah, the back of all the card. The back of all the cards have terms um, that you can familiarize yourself yeah. with that are definitions, like a glossary of sorts. 
So we, we are launching this gender equity toolkit today, as Linda was saying in the introduction. Um, it is just the beginning. We're going to spend the entire at AIGA to try to share this information, share this practice with our chapters, with our members, and outside. Um, it is also a, a material that you can ac actually have access online right now. As we said, we played two videos out of three. Um, but we will actually have um, a printed version, like the one you see, in a few months. We're like wrapping up the, the edits, and, the, and Deb has been very kind to, to donate her design um, uh, skills to, to making this happen. So stay tuned. Uh, it'll be for sale. We'll, we'll manage to keep it uh, accessible and affordable, but it'll be for sale for members. And we will you know, unfold with, with Linda and Deb a strategy to reach out to many different um, groups um, that can be concerned by these conversations. Right, and if you signed up on the email list at the conference, you will receive an email when it's ready. Great. One last okay. word of wisdom, and we're closing. Um, my word of wisdom is just to have confidence in yourself and have confidence. All, yeah, just have confidence. Sounds great. What about you, Linda? I was going to say pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Deb? I think empathy is also the key to unlocking um, so many issues that we have. And just by connecting with people and understanding each other better, we're really going to um, get to a better place. Thank you great. all. This Thanks. is a great conversation. Yeah. And again, to be continued, we will host another Design for Good webcast in a month. We've been uh, scheduling them every Friday, the third Friday of the month at 12 o'clock. This week, obviously, we couldn't do that because I think you guys are going to be busy looking at somebody else on, on TV or otherwise. Uh, but we look forward to having you on February 17th at 12 o'clock, and we will talk about design in cities. Thank you again, thank and thank you, you to our... Um, to our sponsor, NEA and IBM. Bye-bye.